Well, amen. That's good singing. I heard all of you. Well, it's great to be here. Good to be back in China Grove. It's great to be back in Rowan County since the 1st of August of last year when uh, we officially retired. And, of course, um, we live in the town of faith, bustling on July the 4th. <laughs> and other times it's there. And uh, so we're right on the main street, parade route, and Candy Haven. So uh, anyway, but we're glad to be here today. <clears throat> and uh, it's a little strange, as they said, um, Melody and I both went to East Rowan, and um, then, of course, our three sons went to South Rowan. Uh, one of our uh, grandsons now is at Carson, and, uh, of course, another daughter, granddaughter at China Grove Middle, uh, China Grove Elementary for a younger grandson, and two more still preschool from our youngest son, John. So we've got seven grandchildren. Our two oldest ones were as well uh, South Rowan graduates. And um, so anyway, we're glad to be here today, glad to fill in these next two weeks for you um, and get here and uh, bring you God's word. Uh, fresh off, I say fresh, we're, we're far from fresh. Um, we got in the bed early yesterday morning from Greece after about three hours sleep within 48 hours. So we're, uh, <clears throat> we're getting caught up. Uh, but it's, it takes a while, but it's okay. I'm glad I'd rather be here than anywhere today. And uh, that's the good news. Um, we were scheduled to be in Israel last October, two weeks after Hamas decided to do what they did. And, of course, we had to switch gears and go to what was going to be our next journey. Um, it was, of course, Greece, and we were going back there from our 2017 trip that we also took and, and lead folks. So we just got back with 37 uh, in the land of Greece, footsteps of Paul and John as we went over into Turkey uh, on the cruise part of it that takes you over there and by the islands, uh, by Patmos, going to the top where John received the revelation. And uh, it's just something about following those steps. But it's a grueling trip, I'll, I'll be honest with you. And even more so grueling this time because of the number of hours we had to go on the bus and be back and forth. So um, we're just glad to be here. And glad to be anywhere, actually, this morning uh, with you. But I appreciate your worship. Great to see Jonas again. We've known him through all these years, back when the pastor there uh, in Kannapolis. And some of those that have we've met and some of the teachers and former students and those who maybe went to school with our, our, our uh, boys and those that we've known that we've pastored their parents, Miss Willa, and uh, others that are here today. So great to be with you during this particular time. So... Let's get into the Word of God. They never told me how much time I've got. That's a joke. No, they didn't really. They didn't really tell me how much time I have, but I'm going to try to deliver a message. I'll try to do it as quickly as I can, so I want you to listen very quickly today. I normally take a passage of Scripture, and I break it down, uh, and I go through it expositionally. Today, I want to do something a little bit different because I want to be on current events of what is happening in the world and how we look at that and how that has biblical ramifications and all that begins to, to you began to look at there. And so as, as uh, we came, we talked about maybe coming, filling in for these couple of weeks, I thought as, as God laid on my heart a few weeks ago what this message should be, um, I wanted to bring a message on all eyes on Jerusalem because it's very important for us to look and see what is happening worldwide, how that fits into current events, how it causes us to look at biblical prophecy. Now this morning I can do nothing more than give you a 10,000 foot glance at what uh, we're looking at today, but I do want us to look at that. So what I'm going to do today is lead more of a, just lay a premise with a passage found in Isaiah chapter 62, verses 6 through 7. Uh, and I want to uh, just read those two verses at this time, I'm not sure what you're accustomed to. But uh, I usually say, if you can stand, stand, and we'll honor God's word at this time as we uh, read that. So in verse number uh, 6 of Isaiah chapter 62, he says this, I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent, and give him no rest until he establishes, until he makes Jerusalem a praise 
in the earth. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. It is powerful. It always has been. And you've given it to us today. And so I pray that you would take my lips today, cleanse me, Lord, uh, and, and, and just fill me by your Holy Spirit to bring forth the words that you've given me to those who are here today. We're not here by accident, but by your divine promise and providence. And I ask that you'll speak to every heart, that you would challenge us and see the importance of this passage, the importance of Jerusalem and Israel and the world, and how that affects us as believers looking to the future. And we'll thank you for how you call us to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Well, as we look at this particular passage of Scripture and it talks about Jerusalem, it talks about Israel, it causes our minds to be drawn again to the very fact of what has been called the center of the earth. Why are all eyes on Jerusalem? I remember in 1981 as a uh, young associate pastor, 23 years old in the first church, and we had opportunity to go to Jerusalem and getting the glimpse of those walls and what Jerusalem looked like, I'll never forget it. And I'll say this, as we ride through the tunnel, making our way up from below sea level in Jericho all the way up, if you've taken that journey, uh, you, you began to go through a tunnel finally coming in, and on your left are the walls and the Dome of the Rock and all that lies before you, and it still gives you a feeling as the glory bumps rush all across you. There's something about seeing the city of God that causes your heart to race. And so what is it about Jerusalem? And why are all eyes on Jerusalem today as we began to look at this? It's been called the center of the world. As a matter of fact, inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, there's actually a, a pillar that says this is the center of the world. It actually is the convergence of the, of the um, continents of Europe, of Asia, and Africa as they come together at that particular place. Over a hundred major battles have been fought there, not talking about the minor battles, skirmishes, conflicts, and those kinds of things. So you think about that and you see the evening news. What you may see is that if there have reporters from around the world, they're going to have someone from London, they're going to have someone maybe from Moscow, they're going to have someone from Jerusalem because it is such a major part of the world and things that are happening begin to happen right there. The English statesman and author Benjamin Disraeli once said, the view of Jerusalem is the history of the world, but it is more. It is the history of earth and of heaven. It's also a forecast of the future and answer for all of mankind. Jerusalem is the most significant city in all the world. It always has been. It always is today, and it always will be looking to the future. So we want to see what is it that causes Israel to be, and Jerusalem to be, that center of the world as we look at it biblically, as we look at it and what is happening today, and looking to the future. All eyes are on Jerusalem. Jerusalem is mentioned, referred to some 811 times in God's word. It is there, not by accident, but by God's promise and providence because of what he has said about it. All eyes are on Jerusalem because it is in the dead center of the crosshairs of future events. So let's examine some things about it. Did a very simple outline today, though it is sort of alliterated today. Uh, all eyes are on Jerusalem because it is a holy city of the past, first of all. What is it about Jerusalem? Well, God watches over Jerusalem and the nation of Israel like a protective parent. Why? Because they deserve it? No, simply because God said, I do and I will and I will accomplish my purposes. That's one thing about God. What he says he's going to do, you can count on it. You can't count on the stock market. You can't count on politicians but you can count on the God of the universe. You can count on the word of God, and that's exactly what he says he's going to do. So God wanted to have a physical place on the earth that would represent who he was and who he is, and so he established that significant place, as it says in Isaiah 19, verse 25, to become an inheritance in the earth. A specific place where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants could continue to come to. So God chooses 
Jerusalem as his city, according to 1 Kings 8.44. Five times in Deuteronomy 12, Jerusalem is the place that God chooses to put his name for his dwelling place, and there you shall go. So speaking of Jerusalem, speaking of the temple and presenting their offerings there, Jerusalem is presented as the biblical place, the center point, sometimes called Zion. Uh, It is referred to by numerous names uh, throughout the word of God, even Salem at times. And so there are many things that it's referred to, but it's always the center point of history. We know in in 2 Chronicles uh, it's referred to as God's city. In Psalm 132 it says that God has chosen Zion, that other name, uh, to... uh Uh, that he's desired it for his habitation. And he says, this is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, and for I have desired it. So he gives to Israel the national boundaries. Do you know that Israel has never really taken those national boundaries that God gave to them, as he says, from the river Euphrates to the great sea? Uh, down to Egypt. He talks about what those parameters would be. Even when Joshua and the people went in, they never took all that God had for them. Is that not true for us today? Someone said that when we get to heaven, one of the greatest surprises is going to be the great warehouse that God takes us to and says, this is where I stored all the things I had in store for you, but you never ask. Could it be? I don't know. But I do know that we don't rely upon him as much as we ought to when we start thinking about that. Psalm 121 verse 4 says, He who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. And the prophet Zechariah in chapter 2 verse 8 describes Israel as the apple of God's eye. It says, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. God has, uh, a special, has given a special assignment to the archangel to watch over Israel. According to prophetic passages of Daniel 10, uh, in verse 13, 21, chapter 12, verse 1, Revelation, chapter 12, verse 7. Again, I tell you, we're flying at 10,000 feet over this because we're going to get through it. But we're talking about what God's always done in the past. Jerusalem is the place where you can look. If you want to feel the pulse of God's word and history and prophetic events, just put it on Israel, and you'll see what God is doing in the midst of this. Now, as I said, We were looking to go to Israel, to be back there on our sixth trip in 14 years, taking uh, some 47 people that were going to go. I guess the the only thing worse of having uh, not been able to go would to be there when all this broke out, and you're trying to get out and slip through Jordan and come back that particular way, which they had to do to some of their groups that were over there. Um, But you know that God's taking care of you. It's hard for me to tell you how protected you feel there. You feel safer there than you do in Rowan County. Some of you will say, I can't believe that because I feel very safe. Well, okay. <laughs> That's nice. But if you've never been, you can't possibly because it's, it, you can't possibly know because it's not something you just know about. It's something you feel. And that's why there's something that continues to draw you back to the place that God calls his city. So, The divine eye in the sky is constantly watching over Israel. What is going on? His protective eye, specifically Jerusalem. We think this world is out of control. You want to know a secret? Sometimes God will just allow us to go far enough to see how we can't make it without him. And then he shows up. And he does what he's going to do. And guess what? He tells us what he's going to do. He's going to protect Israel at all costs. And so he told Abraham in this covenant, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you of all the families of the earth. There is no clearer scripture why we must always stand with Israel. Because we're on God's side. And to stand against her is to stand against Almighty God. God has proven that over and over again. Even how he blessed a crooked Laban when uh, he blessed his flocks because of the presence of God's man there with him and what God's purposes were at that particular time. So we looked at that. We looked at how God protected Israel. You remember the passage in 2 Kings chapter number 18 where the Assyrian army of Sennacherib was gathered around the holy city 
And of course, there were chariots of fire because of God's protective forces and 185,000 Assyrians were wiped out because they came against God's holy city and against the people of God. What about Jesus? Jesus said himself, John chapter 4, verse 22, salvation is of the Jews. Speaking of the history of how salvation came through the Old Testament and through his life, Christianity, but it came through the Jews. Of course, Jesus being Jewish himself, having grown up there in the Jewish home, abiding by those principles, dedicated in the city of Jerusalem. It's always been about what God's doing in Jerusalem. Jesus loved Jerusalem, dedicated there as a baby, went there to be with the scholars at the age of 12. Of course, we know that he gave his life on the cross there. He had wept over Jerusalem. He was raised from the dead in Jerusalem, and he ascended back to heaven in Jerusalem, the most important city in the world. Jesus, of course, was received there with hosannas, And then we know that the crowd turned against him because of the mob that was there and according to the great providence of God that he would have to give his life in atonement for our sins. God allowed that to happen because we needed a Savior. And that was the divine purpose of why he came to this earth, to die on the cross for the sins of the world, namely our sins. And yes, he knew us 2,000 years ago. Why and how? Because he's God. He's Almighty God and can do anything, and he does. And so he died for us there. It was in Jerusalem that Jesus not only was there and died on the cross, he was resurrected, but he gave the great commission to go into all the world and uh, preach the gospel and see many come to know him as Savior. And, and uh, the disciples gathered in Jerusalem when the first church was started right there in Jerusalem. So all eyes are on Jerusalem because it is the holy city of the past. But let's race ahead. It's also the holy city of the present. What's taking place in Jerusalem? Of course, historically, you know that modern-day Israel has only been in existence since 1948. It was on November the 29th, 1947, that the United Nations uh, voted 33 to 13 to recognize Israel as a sovereign nation. And on May the 14th, 1948, just now has celebrated its 76th year, we find that David Ben-Gurion, who the airport is named after, proclaimed the establishment of the state of Israel. And on that same day, 11 minutes after that statement by David Ben-Gurion, President Harry Truman recognized the state of Israel as a nation. You see... All of this is in the present, as we would call it, when you think about thousands of years of the past. It is the holy city of the present. We know that it has, uh, it has gone through great tragedy uh, because of that, because of their rejection of the Savior, because of Jesus' own words of what would take place after he's gone because they rejected him. In A.D. 70, Titus, the Roman general, leveled the city burnt the city, not one stone was left upon another stone there. It was part of the judgment for denying the Savior. But still, in God's eye, in God's timing, how many times have we walked out of God's perfect will only to find that he's calling us back to himself and that he can use us again? That's the way that God always works, and he will always work with his people because he said that he was going to do it. Never has a nation been dispersed over the places of this world for over 1,900 years and come back together to exist again as a nation like Israel and, of course, Jerusalem being the headquarters there. Um, When we think of that, we think about Ezekiel's promise 2,600 years ago as he spoke about that being the valley of dry bones, how he was going to bring it back together, and literally the prophecy of taking wings of eagles and flocking back to Jerusalem and it becoming a nation again. Chapter 36 also said that the land itself will be restored upon that the Jewish people will return. And in the 19th century, we find... And before they came back, 1948, only 657 
thousand people were there, but it, they formed that new state of Israel, and today there's 11 and a half million people that are there. Ever since that time, there have been seven recognized wars, two Palestinian infatadas, a series of armed conflicts, most notably the 1967 Six-Day War when six Arab nations came against Israel with overwhelming odds but were soundly defeated. And they walk out with control again of who they are. Why? Not because of their might, but because of God's might. And that's what he does. We'll never be anything in ourselves except for the Lord and what he does in our life. He is our strength. He is our shield. He is our mighty fortress. The total Arab losses were more than 20,000 in six days and only 700 for Israel. David Levy noted, ever since this time, the nation has experienced new life and restoration. First, uh, like a tree sprouting its new branches and leaves and fruit. Uh, second of all, it's producing abundantly. It's being tilled in some, some places three and four crops a year as it comes forth. Uh, thirdly, the cities are being rebuilt, re-inhabited. Tel Aviv, of course, has been known for years as that modern city. Fourth, the land has been reclaimed from Israel's ruins and rebuilt. And fifth, the land is repopulated with the Jewish people. So all of these were prophecies that were talked about here in the word of God. And the Israelites took final possession of that, especially in 1973 as they are in the, in the midst of, um, of, of, the, of the city of Jerusalem, especially uh, Jerusalem as we know it today came back together. So there's something about going to that holy city knowing that this is the city of God. This is the city where it has happened in the past, is happening today as God protects it. Who would have guessed that Hamas on October the 7th would have launched an attack killing 1,200 innocent civilians and soldiers? 1,200. Sometimes lost in the news media as they tried to paint Israel as being the bad guy. They poked the bear. And when you poke the bear and God's on their side, you're in trouble. And they've had, they've had tremendous losses as a result of that. But we have to remember, the citizens of Gaza and that area elected Hamas not only as a, as a leadership, as a government. They made the rules, they put them in place, and there are consequences that come with that. We're not happy about that. But when you start something and you burn babies alive in ovens, and you cut babies out of mother's stomachs, and you do the awful things they did that I'll not go any further with that, there is a price to pay against God's people. And so God is taking care of the situation there. Much of the world says, stop where you are. Let me just say this for right now. You can't stop and allow them to do this again. You've got to finish what has been started. To fit. So stop now is to give them all they need to repopulate and do it again. So they're doing what they have to do, though the world has turned against them, but they always have been against them. The world will always be against them, and the future tells us they will be against them again, and they will be soundly defeated. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting ready to go to the future. There's something unexplainable about Jerusalem, that spiritual land of what God has done and how, what he is doing today and how he still protects and blesses in the midst of it, not because of who they are, because the majority do not recognize Jesus as Messiah. Even many who claim to be Jewish are not practicing Jews. But there are many Muslims there, of course, as well in the land. And so uh, it, it still is doing things in the present. And back, of course, on the 70th anniversary uh, President Trump at that time recognized Jerusalem as the capital and said the embassy, the American embassy, will now be established here rather than Tel Aviv. So God's doing a work. It is the holy city of the past, the holy city of the present, but then let's look ahead to the holy city of the future. What will God do in the times to come? Well, Jerusalem is that epicenter of prophetic history of what God is going to do. Again, uh, there, there's a whole series that I preached on the end time events that takes about 12, 13, 14 weeks to go through. But 
again, to give you this overview today, everything in the future points toward Jerusalem. Today, Jerusalem uh, is preparing to rebuild the third temple. We have been to the Institute of Creation, um, uh, the, the Institute of Temple Research, and of course, they, are, they have the priest garments ready, they have the table of showbread ready, and of course, you may have heard last year that they now have the red heifers that are necessary for the burning, their ashes in, in their worship as Jewish worship as it has been known will be reestablished there. And you have to have red heifers without a spot or blemish. They have to be at least three years old. They're already at least two years old. And these have been relocated to Israel. So things are in place. Because we know, according to prophetic history, that the temple will have to be rebuilt. It will be rebuilt on Temple Mount. How's that going to take place? Because it sits on the midst of the Dome of the Rock. The Dome of the Rock is the place that covers Mount Moriah, as we know it in Genesis chapter 22, where Abraham offered his son as a sacrifice. And as he did so, that was the place where it would be the place of the temple. And there will be another temple built there, somewhere on Temple Mount. You say, how can that take place? I don't know if it's going to be an earthquake. I don't know if it's going to be a peace treaty. I just know that some three and a half years into the great tribulation, after the rapture has taken true believers out of here, that is going to be reestablished as temple worship and the Antichrist will be peaceful until he goes in and desecrates the temple and then it's all going to break loose. And so it's racing toward those seven years and a dramatic conclusion there before Jesus comes and takes us out, takes those who were there at that time out of there. And of course, we who are believers will come back with him already being in heaven. So when you look at this, uh, it's, it's during this time that the Arab uh, consortium, the, the nations will get together. Are you already seeing that take place? Did you see that uh, these over 300 uh, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and armed drones came against Israel? Why? From Iran. Iran has never directly hit Israel. It has never come. It's unprecedented. But it, it holds a biblical significance that things are going to happen. And these all of these nations, the Arab nations, will try to come together and come against Israel, but we know their future is going to be going down the tubes because God said, I will give Abraham uh, and, a and Isaac and Jacob their seed forever according to the blood covenant, and I will pour out my fury on all who try to take it from them. So Gog and Magog will come uh, against Israel, and God will again defend Israel, his people. How's he going to do that? When it looks like the overwhelming odds, as even today, the nations, Arab nations come against Israel, how do they shoot down 99% of all missiles? Even today with the Iron Drome, and even while we've been over there, they, they've shot rockets. They don't come anywhere near you. But they, they let them fall into barren places, but the Iron Drome uh, Dome can detect whenever there is going to be something that's going to hit a place of significance or people, populated areas, and that's what they'll shoot down. So along with uh, what the U.S. provided and, and even Saudi Arabia and some out of Jordan, which you wondered if they would stand. But these missiles and all came from uh, some from Syria, uh, the Houthi rebels in, in Yemen. Uh, all these places will come against Israel, but God will continue. That's a major miracle that God just defended. And you saw all these rockets coming in and they were all shot down. Uh, the, the Iron Dome is something we don't have here in America. They also have something for the long-range missiles called David's Sling. What a name to put on that. And I could go further because of the names of the tanks, because of the names of even the further missiles that come in. Uh, and so, uh, but it's what God has put together here. And, and so we know that in the future, God's going to continue to say, this is my holy city. And what is he going to do then? Well, the scripture tells us that when these armies come against them and it looks like they're going to defeat Israel, God's going to send a major earthquake. Then it says that he's going to send major hailstones against them to wipe them out. And then all of a sudden, they're going to start fighting against each other. Five out of six of them will be killed. 
And so God takes care of the enemies. You say, well, that sounds like some kind of cartoon or, or fiction. No, it just sounds like the fulfillment of God's word. Others may not know what they're talking about, but you can count on God fulfilling his word. God's eyes are on Jerusalem. And so the Antichrist is doing his work. Everything comes down to that time, the final battle of Armageddon. And when it looks like mankind will wipe out each other, all of a sudden those skies are going to split and Jesus will come riding forth, not this time as the lamb, but as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he will come with a sword that proceeds out of his mouth, not coming in mercy, but coming in judgment. And he says he will wipe them out and the blood will run as high as the horse's bridles and it will be a resounding victory. What's going to happen then? Jesus then goes to Jerusalem. His foot hits the Mount of Olives. It cleaves in the midst all the way down to the Dead Sea. God, he does a work and he sets up his, his millennial kingdom upon this earth for a thousand years. Satan is bound, hallelujah. So where are we? Well, we as believers who have gone in the raptures right before the tribulation starts, we're with him. We're coming back with him. So the Lord comes, according to Jude, with 10,000 of his saints riding together with him, and he says, we will rule and reign with him upon this earth. You know what? I can't understand everything that's happening in the world, and I certainly don't know it all, but I'm glad I know one who does who's got it written out, who knows exactly what's taking place. And so let me ask you this question in closing. Are you ready for that day? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior? You can't put your hope in anything in this world. Everything else will fall and fail before you, but you can only look to Him. And He's provided the way of salvation through His dear Son, Jesus. He's the only one who will save our souls, save our life, and he will come to take us out of here before that great tribulation hits and spare us from that. We will go through tribulation. We do every day, don't we? But we have not go through the great tribulation. And at the end, we'll come back with him after we have been with him those uh, seven years. And we will rule and reign with him. And then there's a new heaven and a new earth that he brings about. God has all written down. So let me ask you, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior? Have you trusted him? Do you know him personally? And if not, why not? And if not, why not today? Why not trust him while there is time that you know you're, you're ready and you can live for him with great assurance that he's going to bring about the victory? And then I would say this. Well, you say, well, I, I've done that many years ago. You know, I, I've done that. Well, what does it mean to you today? Are you living for him? You hear people talk about, well, we used to do this and we used to do that. Listen, what, what's God doing in your life today? What's, how's he using you and how does that come to fruition today in your life of who he is and what he wants to do in your life? How does he want to work in your life while there is time? As a matter of fact, you can use some of this as ammunition if you want to and apologetics to know that we're on the right side, but you need to stay true. Why? Because as believers, we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Not to be judged of salvation, because we already are saved and know him, but to be judged according to our works. And what does the Bible say except that some will receive crowns in that day that we can cast at Jesus' feet? That's why important. it's important. Our plaques, our trophies and things that we've won in athletics through the years will not matter. All the prestige and honors but what we've done for Christ since the time of our salvation will be judged and we can lay those at his feet. It says that some will, will have a full reward, some will have a partial reward, and some will have no reward at all. They'll barely make it in. Those who know Christ but said, well, I, I want to know that I'm going there, but I'm not going to live for him. I want to live for myself and the world while I'm here. Well, I just say there is a judgment coming individually for us as believers, so we want to be prepared. How's your heart today? Do you know that as his eye is on Jerusalem and Israel, his eye is on you? And as his eye is on the sparrow, be sure he, he watches over you. Would you bow your head with me at this time? And Father, in Jesus' name, I just thank you for this opportunity to bring your word. I thank you for the significance of the nation of Israel and Jerusalem in, uh, in what you've given us in your word of what it has in the past, what it is in the present, and what it will be in the future. With that in mind, Lord, you are Lord of the past, you're Lord of the present, and you are Lord of the future. 
And so, Lord, today, would you call those to you who have never trusted Christ as their Savior. Maybe they know about him, but they don't know him personally. Would you allow them to come today? And I just pray that you would deal with our hearts. If we're not living for you, Lord, may this be a day where we come and we just kneel in a time of recommitment and fresh surrender today unto you. Whatever decision needs to be made, maybe a burden is heavy upon the heart as this altar is open and our invitation song is brought before us. We'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name.